Hello and welcome to the Kufa UK podcast for Zion's sake. My name is Alistair, this is Alex. Hello. And in today's podcast, we discuss the detonation of electronic devices belonging to Hezbollah members in Lebanon and what message this sends Israel's enemies. That's right. We're also going to be talking about the United Nations and how they've allowed the Palestinian Authority, or in their words, the State of Palestine, to have a seat at the UN General Assembly. We're also going to be looking at Prime Minister Netanyahu's comments about our Prime Minister, Britain's Prime Minister, Keir Starmer. Do you mean two states, Starmer? (laughs) And also, we're going to be discussing your comments. So please let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Or you can page us. I just got a message. Okay then, Alex. So, to start the podcast, let's discuss the big news of this week. So far, this week, yep. uh, at the time of we doing this podcast, we know that there was a major cyber attack in Lebanon on Tuesday and on Wednesday, yep. unprecedented. I mean, this was the largest cyber attack ever mm-hmm. in human history. Uh, when, of course, the pager devices belonging to Hezbollah members exploded in Beirut and other places in Lebanon. Um, you and I have been talking about this story the past couple of days. We have absolutely no idea who yep. is behind it. Clueless. We? We've we, been yeah. analysing all the info. <laughs> we have no idea. Uh, but on a serious note, of course, Israel has not, um, not accepted responsibility. They've not made any comment whatsoever, but I think we know who is behind this attack. Yep. But let's just look at this then in the overall picture and what has happened, what's taken place and what might be happening next. Mindful that things are changing hour to hour, day to day. Other things might have happened since we've sat here doing this podcast. Mm. But on Tuesday then, in in Lebanon, pager devices self-detonated. Yeah. Um, Self-detonated, of course, they were something had been tampered with all of them and we're talking about thousands of pager devices yeah exploding only those belonging to members of the hezbollah terrorist group yeah exactly and it was just mind-boggling really how this could even be executed in a way yeah um but then of course on wednesday there was another round of explosions this time uh, mobile phones cell phones um as well as um, two-way radios or walkie-talkies as we call them exploding again belonging to Hezbollah yeah. and there's some other devices as well solar panels and things like that but this was a targeted attack this was not random this was not you know targeting with intent of ordinary um, Lebanese people but specifically these were targeting members of Hezbollah yeah exactly and it's the kind of thing that we sort of see in movies and you know when the spy agencies carry out you know these you know big plans and things like that and i think actually this is a real life example of that happening and i think like you said we don't exactly know uh who did it because nobody's claimed responsibility for it but i think all all of uh israel's enemies have kind of got a message this week that uh if you mess with israel something bad will happen to you. <laughs> so, well, yes. I, I mean, look, look, we can talk the about message. the message which was <laughs> sent, which caused, we believe, the... Uh, and so just to yeah. perhaps explain some of the... Technology, we don't really understand. People are still trying to work out what happened. But it would seem yeah. as though some kind of detonating material was placed within these thousands of devices uh, in a controlled way and either by sending a message which triggered some uh some kind of overheating then causes this, these explosions mm. um but yeah we can only hypothesize we don't we're not engineers no. we have no idea what yeah. happened all we know is what the media is reporting which is these devices exploded somehow it happened su- simultaneously thousands yes. of them at the same time and the other thing is 99 percent of the victims were men who belonged to the hezbollah terror yeah. group so, so we're it not was a be, very, yes. very precise attack, yeah. as you were saying before. Yeah. Uh, it's trying to be... And it's not actually the message which was sent that we're interested in. We're interested in, in the messaging that was sent. 
yeah, yeah. to Hezbollah. Yeah, exactly. Right? And so that's what we're going to be talking about. We know that there have been hundreds, if not thousands. In fact, on Tuesday, apparently there were 3,000 people who have been, who were injured. Yeah. Um, tw- uh, 12 that were killed. And then on Wednesday, uh, 450 were wounded. 25 uh, is the figure, latest figure as we do this podcast that were killed. That figure is rising. Um, we know that some of the injuries are, are quite uh, severe because these were handheld devices as they picked up and read the message. You know, th- these were um, injuries which occurred to people's, uh, to the terrorist hands, faces. Yeah. Um, Hezbollah right now are in a, a state of chaos yep. and of confusion. I mean, just imagine, they did not know this was going to happen. No. They've not ex- ha- experienced this in any way before. Um, there have been some one-off attacks uh, uh, attacks which Israel has on targeting terrorist leaders using devices and it's because of that reason that earlier this year Hezbollah ordered these pages mm. which to you and I might seem quite old technology yep. um, but one of the reasons why they used pages was in order to circumnavigate the sort of uh, cellular networks which they were concerned Hezbollah, uh, Israel would be able to um, to hack into and tamper yeah. with. Well, actually, what has occurred is these pager devices have been uh, tampered with. Yeah, that's right. I think Hezbollah have been forced, actually, because of Israel's high-tech sort of mm. uh, surveillance and, and that sort of thing, they've been forced to use more primitive devices such as the pagers. Well, now it's being reported they're actually going back to even more primitive ways of communication. They're throwing out... Pigeons? Uh, pigeon, yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, handwritten notes hopefully paper can't explode on them sort of thing uh, but yeah you know there's i i'm thinking now i mean we have to say these were not just sort of anyone these were hezbollah terrorists and yeah. also many of them were high up in hezbollah yes. hezbollah has tens of thousands of members this was just three thousand who were in the coordination and yes. planning sort of groups of hezbollah yes one of the key people who was injured actually in the attack was uh, the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon. Yes. So, well, you what, may, you know, what does that tell you? Yeah. I mean, what does that show you? You know. Yeah. Let's find out who are members of Hezbollah. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And then, and then these detonations happen, and some of them are, in fact, there are IRGC members as well. Yes. Who yeah. were also um, uh, had their devices detonated, and yeah. one of them is the Iranian ambassador yeah. who's on the. Well, not the WhatsApp um, group, but you know the paging <laughs> group of Hezbollah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, doesn't that just show you? I mean, let's be clear: Hezbollah is a proxy of the Iranian regime, yeah. but they're more than just a proxy. Actually, over the last few months, past couple of years, Hezbollah is Iran on yeah. the doorstep of Israel. Exactly, and and that's the thing. Nasrallah has said it for years. Everything that Hezbollah eats, everything Hezbollah drinks, every rocket Hezbollah fires is paid for by the Iranian regime. Yeah. So, you know, it's far more actually Iran is far more involved with Hezbollah than it is with Hamas. Yeah. So, understanding it, it like this, you know, if it was Israel, we think it was Israel, actually some senior people within Israel have said that they think it's Israel. So, for example, Jonathan uh, Conricus, who is uh, the former international spokesperson for the IDF, he's now retired from the military after decades of service. He actually is a friend of Kufi as well. He spoke at the Kufi summit. Um, he says that he does think it was um, Israel, but he actually said he doesn't think um, that Israel really needs to admit to it because you know, Hezbollah, the Iranians, the Syrians involved, and everybody else around the world understands what happened. Mm. And he said he doesn't think that anyone else in the world has either the interest or the capacity to attack Hezbollah yes. in such a surgical and pre- uh, precise manner. A precise you know, manner. And, yeah. and that's, we, re- we re-emphasize, it is the, the precision, right, which if it was Israel, okay, they have managed to... Uh, well, they managed to do a couple of things, right? Not only have they targeted Hezbollah members without firing a single shot, mm. okay, and by causing very minimal, very minimal collateral consequences yeah. when you consider how many terrorists have been 
targeted. Yeah. It could only take a precision attack yeah. uh, like that. But also, they have disabled Hezbollah's main communication network yeah. for its high-end terrorists. Yeah. Now, whether or not Israel is behind it or not, Israel now has a window of opportunity to perhaps do whatever it might feel necessary to do in order to <clears throat> to hit Hezbollah even harder than it has done before. Yeah. Let's not forget that there are 82,000 civilians that are not in their homes in Northern Israel. Israel. Israeli civilians, yeah. Israeli c- civilians who are not in their homes in Northern Israel. They're not going to school, to their schools, right? And since the 8th of October, 2023, Hezbollah has fired 7,500 rockets at Israel. Yep. And if you have not been watching what's been taking place over the last few months, and you just switch on your news and find out that Israel has allegedly um, decided to take uh, these steps against Hezbollah members, and you, you are missing the point. Yeah that Israel is having to defend itself from terrorists just as it has against Hamas in Gaza. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's a lot of things we have to address within this, you know, within this talk, really, because, you know, I think you have raised a few points there. It's being described as indiscriminate, when actually it is probably one of the most surgical strikes in history on such a wide, you know, large number of mm. targets. Nine, like I said, 99% of those, I mean, Every single person I saw in the hospital who was injured, you know, in the videos that have been going around on social media and things, they're all men. That you know, it's like clear that they are men. You know, not necessarily clear they're members of a group because that obviously that's you can't tell by just looking at man. But it's clearly it's men. You can't have ninety nine percent men injured and call it indiscriminate and attacking women and children and so forth. That is just a lie. Um, actually, within this uh, interview where Jonathan. Uh, Conricus was, uh, you know, speaking to the BBC. These are the things she was throwing at him. How, you know, this was indiscriminate. Children have been injured, and he fired back and he said, "A couple of children have been injured, but you know, Hezbollah have fired, like you said, seven thousand five hundred rockets over the border between mm-hmm. Lebanon and Israel since October the eighth. They are they are truly indiscriminate. They." cause hundreds yep. of thousands of Israelis to go to bomb shelters every single time. Yes. You know, one of those rockets that landed killed 12 children who yes. were playing football. 27th of July. Yeah. And and those young children who were playing football, right, Hezbollah admitted that that was a deliberate target of civilians. Yeah. Not a stray rocket, not collateral damage, as they say. Yeah, in yeah. Quotes. No, they targeted civilians. They admitted it. Yep. They came up with some, some excuse at the time, if I remember, why they did it. Yep. Look, Israel has got to defend its borders. Yeah, and, and Israel has complete legal, you know, international law, legality, all the rest of it. They are adhering to the, the strict rules of engagement that the, the Israeli military puts yeah. itself under. And like some other stats, I mean, like you said, you know, it's sort of, I think the estimate is between 80 and uh, 100,000 Israeli civilians who have moved out of the mm. border area. That's a massive economic uh, issue for Israel because that's a lot of people who are not working, not farming, not, you know, generating income. They've moved to places where they're staying in hotels. You know, it's a big economic mm. burden there. And um, many people may not They don't even realize that. that, yeah. And, you know, as well as those 12 children, there's, there's been 46 Israelis who have been killed by Hezbollah rockets. Um, over the last 11 month, months. So more people have been killed by Hezbollah rockets than this, mm. uh, the, the devices exploding. And the majority of those killed in Israel are civilians. Yeah. Whereas in this case, it's 99% Hezbollah terrorists. Yeah. And I just want to like hammer home like who Hezbollah is. Hezbollah mm. is a terrorist group. It is outlawed in the UK. Mm. So I do always question why there are media personalities who are seemingly defending Hezbollah mm. and trying to attack Israel over this. And because... I should say, and I should add, following a campaign from Kufa UK. Yeah, that's right. We campaigned and helped to get them banned, which was which was great. Uh, well, actually, everyone who 
supports Kufi are the ones who lobbied the government yeah. and and pressured them. So that's great. But over the past, you know, 45, 50 years, Hezbollah has been a menace to the world. Yeah. You know, Lebanon especially is suffering from Hezbollah's yes. influence. But for example, in 1983, there was the US uh, barracks bombing and the French paramilitary base that were bombed. That resulted in the deaths of 241 US uh, militants and, um, you know, servicemen and women and 58 French soldiers. So, you know, these are big, heavy attacks. Uh, 1992 was uh, the attack on the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires where 29 people were killed, almost all of them civilians. In 1994, the worst ever um, terror attack in South America took place, and that killed um, 85 people who were killed there, and almost all of them were Jewish, because why Hezbollah targeted Mm. Jews? And again, Hezbollah, you know, it was formed in the uh, early 80s, it has been operating with one aim, really, which is to remove Western influence from the Middle East and to remove Israel from the face of the earth. Well, two. That's two things, really, I guess. Mm. Um, but it's its that thing we were talking about last week where it's the, you know, the war against the Judeo-Christian nations, mm. Judeo-Christian values, Christians mm. and Jews. We're in it together, that kind of thing. Hezbollah is literally the epitome of a terrorist group mm. who wants who wants the West destroyed, meaning Christians, mm. and the Jews destroyed, meaning, yeah. well, Jews. Yeah. So it's like, what I'm trying to say is like, this is a, you know, Hezbollah are bad guys. They've yes. killed lots of people. Yes. Um, and we cannot sort of um, try and have an equivalence between who Israel is and who Hezbollah yes, is. Yes. Lebanon is not Hezbollah as well, I have yes. to also point out, because the people of Lebanon are under the threat of Hezbollah. Yes. I don't know if, people remember but there was a uh, bomb that went off or a weapons factory that went off yeah, the a few factory. years ago yeah. in in lebanon yeah killed many people destroyed half a city yeah. you know a massive attack that was because a hezbollah uh, you know hezbollah was using civilian infrastructure to store its weapons next to Civ- civilian yeah. fuel i think it was something went wrong a missile exploded destroyed a massive area caused deaths to Many people. And the Lebanese are living there under the rule of Hezbollah. Yes. And actually, there was an interesting um, there was an interesting video, actually, I saw the other day where it was some women at a coffee shop overlooking uh, sort of like a valley. And in the distance, there were these explosions going off. And it was Israeli airstrikes carrying... They, it, the Israeli Air Force were carrying out airstrikes mm. on a Hezbollah target. Because... Mm. By the way, this isn't a new thing that's been going Mm. on. It's been going on since the 8th of October when Hezbollah attacked Israel. Mm. Hezbollah attacked first. Um, And the the women there didn't stop what they were doing and run for cover. They sat there and sipped their coffee and watched Hezbollah being destroyed. Why? First of all, they know that Israel is not going to harm them because Mm. Israel targets terrorists. Mm. Israel targets Hezbollah. And second of all, you probably find they were enjoying the view of Hezbollah who have been, you know, destroying Lebanon economically mm. and pre- placing women in oppression and all the rest of it. Mm. They were probably not too fussed, actually, that Israel was doing this. Mm. And in fact, we've actually seen on social media, people around the Middle East, people in Lebanon have been posting on social media, mm. mocking Hezbollah, thanking Israel. Mm. You know, there's a lot of memes sort of mocking what's going on. And this is from people around the Middle East, mm. you know, just because Hezbollah is Islamic doesn't mean that Muslims like Hezbollah, right? Mm. You know, he- Hezbollah is a problem for Muslims as mm. much as it is for anyone else because they are a destabilizing force within mm. the Middle East. So actually what you're seeing is a lot of moderate Muslims who are happy with what Israel is doing. And yet the perception we get is from our media that Israel's done something really yes, bad, yeah. that, that Hezbollah are innocent victims. And, all that. and it's like, hang on, guys, you know, you are completely misrepresenting the facts. Mm. You know, you're turning reality on its head. Hezbollah are evil. What Israel is doing, and by the way, Israel isn't just randomly targeting Hezbollah, if it is Israel, let's say, but Hezbollah is being targeted here because it is already 
causing massive problems for Israel. It's already carried out months and months of indiscriminate rocket attacks mm. against Israeli civilians. Mm. Israel had to act, and as far as we know, it did act. Mm. That's right. And there have been a few you know, speculations. We've already mentioned the fact that this is an opportunity that Israel now has to take advantage of a shocked, um, destabilized Hezbollah, confused, yep. uh, hurt, um, fearful Hezbollah. And Israel could, could well, would, I would not be surprised if Israel does now take that further in striking Hezbollah. But there's also been some speculation that this could have been done at a time when Hezbollah was planning something mm. and Israel prevented that by executing this plan. Yeah, exactly. And I think the situation right now for Lebanon, obviously they've got a lot of people in hospitals. Apparently hospitals are overwhelmed. Mm. Um, if they decided to have an all-out war with Israel as a response to this, the hospitals just wouldn't cope with it anyway. Mm. And obviously, the communications are messed up. The senior people within Hezbollah have been injured by this. Um, so I think they're all in disarray at mm. the moment. I think, from my perspective, I think Israel's probably looking at it as an opportunity to give Hezbollah a chance to stop the war. Yes. Because... Ultimately, Israel wants to get to a situation where there is not rockets, thousands of rockets per day being mm. fired into Israel. Yeah. And Israel wants its people who have had to flee the north to actually be able to go back and yeah. live in peace in the north. So for me, I don't necessarily think Israel wants to escalate anything right now. Mm. I know they have, you know, there's been reports of Israel moving tanks and things to the border. I think that is just a preparation in case Hezbollah mm. decides to do anything. Um, but for me, I'm sort of thinking this is a message being sent to Hezbollah, mm. to Iran, that, you know, we can hit you, we can hit you hard, we can hit you where you least well, expect right. us. Yeah. And why don't you stop so we can, you know, have yes. some peace and quiet for a while um, because you're a nuisance to us kind of thing. Yes. Um, yeah, that's kind of uh, my view on it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly they will be, Hezbollah will be thinking, well, what next? What other capabilities would Israel have? Uh, so, yeah, I think it is definitely... A yeah. message that has been sent. Yeah, definitely. Um, multiple messages. Yeah. Uh, but one big message. Exactly. Uh, the question is, though, what will Hezbollah do now? And we can we need to pray. We need yeah. to pray for Israel. Uh, we, we don't know. No. Nope. We, we, we really don't. But one thing we can do is we can, you know, bring these things uh, as watchmen on the wall uh, before God and to pray. Uh, for his protection upon Israel and for wisdom for Israel's leaders because this mm. was a, um, if this was Israel, um, whoever made that uh, decision, it would have been the very top of Israeli government, of course. Um, that's a big decision. Yeah. Uh, all of these are big decisions. So whatever you might think, uh, you know, whatever we might think about the decisions made by Israeli leadership. We must pray for the Israeli leadership. We must pray for wisdom yeah. for Israel's leaders yeah, uh, that they will be guided uh, by God. And yep. so, yeah, we, we want to see Israel blessed. We want to pray for peace uh, in that land. We want to pray for peace in Jerusalem. We want to pray for the people who, uh, as I say, people in Lebanon who detest Hezbollah mm. and there are many Christians who live in Lebanon and um, actually it's rarely said but there are many Christians in Lebanon who are pro-Israel mm. and recognize the fact that um, Israel has a right uh, to live peacefully and securely. Yeah. yeah one thing you just said even though we'll move on to the next subject now mm. I just want to say one thing is we need to be careful we don't normalize what is happening mm. in the northern border. We've spoken about this before mm. where I think what has happened is a lot of people are forgetting that Israelis are living in constant fear, having to mm. go to bomb shelters, obviously civilians being killed because Hezbollah has fired so many rockets mm. over the border. And I would say, personally, I've normalized the rockets coming in from Hezbollah. There are times mm. where you've messaged me late at night on a weekend or something and you've said, you know, 50 rockets have come over from Hezbollah you know that sort of thing and i'm i just sort of reply oh yeah that's just normal now and actually i'm guilty of normalizing it and i think actually we shouldn't 
normalize mm, this because point. you know these israelis every day are living you know in fear and mm. the reason i'm raising this actually is because i was challenged by it when someone said we shouldn't normalize mm. rockets going over ultimately if the news reported every time a rocket barrage came over from hezbollah mm. people would get very bored of the news mm. you know over the course of you know it's 50 a day 30 a day 40 a day a few hundred a day depending on what's going on and so i just think we just need to be aware that even though it's not being reported on the news and i think that is problematic mm. because it means when israel does something big like this mm. or allegedly israel does something big like this we then are not aware of what's been going on for so mm. many years so i just wanted to sort of highlight that that we shouldn't normalize Hezbollah's rockets just as we should never have normalized hamas's rockets yes. or the houthis rockets either no, I think you make a really good point. And actually, it's not just the normalization of Hezbollah's terror. It's normalization of any terror against Israel. Yeah. Earlier this week, there was the supersonic missile rocket, which was fired from the Houthis yeah. towards, uh, to Israel. And actually, it was the first ever rocket by the Houthis uh, in Yemen uh, to actually explode over Israeli territory. So you know, that was substantial. It shows the very real threat from the Houthis. Yeah. And we, have of course, are aware of Hamas's. We've discussed a lot about Hamas's terror. But again, even with that, the, the media that we, we have um, uh, and we watch does really get to a point where they normalize. Yeah, it's not even this. mentioned. It's not even yeah. mentioned. Uh, so I think that's very, very important. And that's part of our... Uh, outworking i think and as supporters of israel this is why we do the campaigns like writing to ump which we're going to uh, mention in a moment but um yes let's not normalize terror against mm. israel uh yeah. let's call it out for what it is and um yeah i think that's a good point to end on before our next our next topic yep we are pleased to announce that the 2024 to 2025 calendar from Christians United for Israel UK is now available to purchase. The title for this year's calendar is The Beauty of Zion. Israel is beautiful and the Bible paints vivid images in our minds through the emotive words used to describe this land of promise. We hope you can experience the beauty of Zion as you make use of the calendar throughout the year. The calendar includes 16 stunning images of Israel with selected inspirational scriptures to help focus your prayers for God's chosen people and their land. The calendar also includes UK Christian and Jewish holidays for the 16 months and includes weekly Torah portions. Plus, we also offer a special bundle discount for adding a mug and greeting cards to the calendar. By purchasing a calendar, or one of our gift bundles, you are supporting the work of Kufi in standing for Israel in the UK. Go to store.cufi.org.uk. So we're going to talk about the United Nations and the UN General Assembly in particular. Hmm. Uh, last week, the Palestinian Authority was given a seat for the first time at the UN General Assembly. Hmm. Uh, that's the, the big one where 193 member states uh, put forward resolutions and debate and so forth. Um, it's important to point out that the Palestinian Authority is still not a full member of the UN. Mm. It is seen as a non-member state. It is called by the UN the State of Palestine. And the new status it now has means it sits in the UN, it can take part in debates, it can put forward resolutions, but it cannot vote on resolutions. Right. So it's not got all the rights of a state um, because it's not a state. Uh, I'll point out there as well that um, countries like Taiwan, you know, with 30-something million people, its own constitution, everything, the UN doesn't even recognize that as a non-member observer state. It recognizes that as part of China, and mm. that is a massive problem where I think it shows the illegitimacy of the United Nations anyway, just that kind of mm. disparity there where you know, a democratic country doesn't even have its own seat and mm. isn't even called, cool. it's actually referred to as the Republic of China, mm. not Taiwan. 
Anyway, that's a separate matter, mm. but it kind of highlights how the Palestinians get very special treatment mm. and just how warped the views of the UN are. Yeah. Well, the UN, so that happened last week when uh, the Palestinian Authority were put into that position. And then this week, the Palestinians put forth their first resolution. It was sponsored by 29 other nations. All other Arab states sponsored it apart from Saudi Arabia. And that resolution uh, was basically putting a time limit on to when um, Israel has to withdraw from all Palestinian mm. territories. So uh, the UN General Assembly um, adopted this resolution saying that they that Israel must end without delay its unlawful presence in the occupied Palestinian territory within 12 months, including all soldiers and civilians. Just so you know, the territory which, the occupied Palestinian territory, which the UN is talking about, includes East Jerusalem, mm. it includes the whole of Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank, mm. um, and it includes... Uh, well, I guess it would include Gaza as well at the moment, because obviously Israeli mm. troops are in Gaza. And it says both soldiers and civilians. The mm. UN voted in favour of that resolution, wow. uh, which is absolutely shameful, disgraceful. Yes, um, They want, you know, the Palestinian territories, first of all, to become a state. And second of all, they want them to be Jew free, which mm. is absolutely preposterous. It should be pointed out that the quote unquote Palestinian territories that the UN is talking about are fully Israel, Judea, Samaria, land of Israel, given to them by God Almighty, Amen. as as dictated by the Bible, and it is where all of the main holy sites for Judaism and Christianity are. Yeah. Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, Tomb of the Patriarchs, mm. you know, Mount of Olives, all these different places, Bethlehem for Christians, like there are, you know, there is no denying the Jewish connection there. And the UN has just voted that all soldiers and civilians must be removed. Yes. Think about that. I know. Absolutely. Same as what the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, well, uh, has called for as well. Exactly. So, I mean, but the United Nations is, I mean, they, they have, in my mind, they're long gone in being yeah. any moral authority. Uh, the fact that they can't um, make even national judgments um, in in this sense. And yeah, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, if you have a panel of countries that are already, have already set themselves against the belief that Israel has a right to exist, then mm. it's not surprising that they're going to pass these anti-Israel, anti-Semitic motions. Yeah. The leadership of the UN must really grow a backbone and start standing up to some of this, but no. we, we we don't see it. I yeah, mean, I think they're part of the problem. Mm. Um, I I heard that apparently they're having an emergency uh, session. Um, maybe today uh, might have already happened. Um, regarding the detonation of the pages in Lebanon, you know, mm. they're very very quick, yep. and yet to this day they still have not condemned Hamas. No, exactly. Yeah, it's just the, you know, it's, it's part of every committee, every element of the United Nations mm. is anti-Israel. Mm. So they they hold Israel to a different standard. It is anti-Semitic. It is, according to the IHRA definition of the word, you know, of the word mm. of anti-Semitism, uh, it proves it because Israel is treated differently to all other nations. Um, I just want to point out who voted for and against this. So in favour, 124 nations were in favour against 14, and then the abstentions, 43. People who voted against it included, uh, for example, the United States and Argentina, uh, places like that. People who but this is very interesting. Well, yeah, Argentina now, yeah. Argentina has had a record number of anti-Semitic incidents since 7th of October, yeah. yet its government... yeah has voted in favour of Israel. That That is hugely significant. Yeah, exactly. And just to point out as well, Argentina, um, it does have, you know, issues with anti-Semitism. Argentina is also the place I was talking about earlier with the bombings from Hezbollah. Yes. You know, the largest terror attacks ever Aires. took yeah. place in Argentina. Buenos Aires. And so, yeah, so that is interesting. Obviously, they've got the new uh, president there now who seems to be moving them in the right direction when it comes to support mm. for Israel. On the flip side, Brazil, which was support, would have been voting against them a few years ago now, with Lula at the helm, is 
uh, you know, voting against Israel. So those two nations are all sort of mm. they're right next to each other, and they've uh, you know changed their positions on Israel dramatically. Yeah, and uh, shows what happens with an election. Um, Absolutely, yeah. that's why we need the right <laughs> leaders. <laughs> exactly, and we'll get onto that in a minute. Um, yeah. Also, I'd say even though. Saudi Arabia didn't sponsor the bill, they did vote for it. So yeah. every single Arab and Muslim nation voted for this resolution. Who abstained? Well, almost all of the European nations. Wait for it. Yeah. Britain? Yeah. yeah. Britain abstained. So another shameful um yeah. another shameful bill. I mean, one thing to point out as well with this is it wasn't just about the land, it wasn't just about um the territories it was also calling on all member states to actually um carry out an arms embargo on israel and further than that to actually boycott israeli goods coming from judea and samaria so these are civilians like farmers growing grapes or wine or whatever selling it to different lands you know 124 nations voted to boycott civilians selling produce yeah so i think this story highlights two things first of all it shows the moral bankruptcy of the united nations second of all i think it shows the intention of the palestinian authority you know they are given a seat at the un and the very first resolution they put forward calls for israel to no longer be allowed you know jews to be no longer allowed access to their holy sites and for every nation to boycott israel and stupidly 124 nations voted for it yeah. and 48 nations abstained including the uk yeah well, which I, th- is terrible. I, I think not being allowed is putting it politely yeah i actually think they want the, the complete removal of every jew yeah in their ancestral homeland yeah and that's why all of these decisions and the uk is pathetic by sitting on the fence yeah is that this does not serve any purpose other than serving into the hands of hamas hezbollah iran and, and the PA. every other, <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and everyone, a, a, every other enemy of Israel. Yeah. So actually, um, yeah, by giving a seat at the table, it just serves into that, yeah. it, into their hands. I'm afraid to say, as does the arms embargo. Yeah. That's why uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this week challenged Britain by mm. saying that the decision by the UK government to uh, enforce a, a partial arms embargo against Israel was absurd. Yeah, and absolute. He was absolutely right. Yep. Um, he gave an interview this week, um, in which he said, um, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Benjamin Netanyahu said, "They say that Israel has the right to defend itself, but they undermine our ability to exercise that right, both by reversing Britain's position on the absurd allegations made by the ICC." the International Criminal Court, prosecutor against Israel, and by blocking weapons sales to Israel as we fight against the genocidal terrorist organization that carried out the October 7th massacre. Mm. He went on, these misguided decisions will not change Israel's determination to defeat Hamas, which savagely murdered 1,200 people on October 7th, including 14 British citizens, and took 255 people, including five British hostages um and he is absolutely right yeah and that that is why we are you know so against this arms embargo yeah um, it empowers hamas and it weakens israel absolutely and it's our government who's doing it so absolutely yeah. yeah so that was that was good um it's a bit of an embarrassment really to our nation mm. quite frankly that uh, you know we have upset israel offended israel in this way yeah um i think the detonation of pages and walkie talkies is perhaps a message also to the rest of the world that actually nothing is going to deter the state of israel from doing what it has to do in its fight against terrorism yeah exactly um so yeah yeah and i think we need to emphasize like israel is fighting a war for its very survival absolutely on multiple fronts and yet, every time Israel does anything, it is, you know, basically called the worst things in the world. It is demonized. You know, it makes terror, you know, the media yeah. constantly makes Israel's enemies look like victims when yeah. they are terrorists trying to annihilate the Jewish people. And we know, you know, this is good versus evil. This is God versus Satan. Yeah. You know, we have to be very real about these 
you know what is going on there this this is much bigger than you know hezbollah it's much bigger than hamas it's much bigger even than israel you know yeah. it's and yet our government thinks you know and the nations of the world think they can dictate you know to yes. god what he wants to happen uh, effectively that's absolutely. what absolutely absolutely so keir starmer you can ban walkie talkies next <laughs> it isn't going to deter israel from um, victory over its enemies. Let's yeah. talk positively here. Yeah. Yep. Let's let's have faith and trust that actually whoever's behind these man-made sabotages, right? We serve a God who is who is even greater yep. than all the secret intelligence and expertise that might be at whoever's disposal. Right? We have a God who is on Israel's side, yep. and we need to pray. Right, that Israel's enemies, as a result of this confusion, right, will either retreat, will definitely get the message mm. that the state of Israel means business when it says it will defend its borders. And we need to pray for our own nation that we will realize that these silly uh, decisions which is trying to send a message to Israel. You know, I can't believe it. The number of politicians who have said in the same sentence, yes, we stand with Israel, we just wanted to send a message. I know. Right? That's literally their, that's literally their statement. I know. You know, we, we, we stand with Israel, we believe in their right to defend itself. This is just a little message. Yeah. Well, do you know what? It makes no difference. It, it is in vain. Mm -hmm. And it is... It, well, I don't want to say it's laughable because we take it very seriously. The bad thing is that actually it will affect Britain more than it will affect Israel. Yeah. Because the Bible says that God will bless those that bless thee, uh, curse those that curse thee. You know, we want to be in blessing in this nation. Yeah. And it was 30 contracts. doesn't matter if it was one, two, three, or 300. Yeah. Right? When we turn our backs on the state of Israel, okay, we need a, well, the Bible says that God will turn a back on us. Yeah, exactly. We need to be praying on our knees right now for this nation yep. that we will not turn our back on Israel or we need anything else, which the God of Israel says. Yeah, exactly. Because we have to take him at his word seriously. Yep. Um, thankfully, these decisions, like the arms embargo, are reversible, but we need to pray that they will be reversed sooner rather than later. Yeah, it concerns me because some of these things, which the current government has done in the first few weeks of its leadership, mm. is a are, are red flags, quite frankly, and we need to make our voice known. We need to make our voice heard. I'm sorry, and we need Israel to know that actually there are Christians, tens of thousands, millions, if you correct me, did <laughs> yeah. I say that? Millions who stand with Israel. Yep. And may God in his mercy look at that, look at that support and see that actually there is a resistance to what's happening in this nation. Yeah. And so what I would say that for those listening and watching, um, you know, we appreciate your support. We appreciate your financial giving. We appreciate your prayers. And there's time where we have to take action. Yeah. This action does not cost anything. Mm. Writing to your MP does not cost anything. We've provided a free facility to write to your MP. You might be worried. What does what will my MP think about me mm. by bringing up this issue? How will they feel about me? Well, if you're not feeling quite brave enough to do that, may I encourage you that God will give you strength. Yep. He will protect you. He will cause no harm to come to you. And he will bless you. And We've provided a facility that you can write to your local MP asking them to pass on your thoughts to the Foreign Secretary. We have written a letter um, to, um, uh, that you can use 
So please go to www.cufi.org.uk forward slash campaigns. The link is also in the description. It yeah. only takes a few moments. It only uh, takes a few simple steps to type in your postcode, to check the letter, and then to hit send. And if you were able to do that after this podcast, we would greatly appreciate it. And you'll be adding your names to, uh, to thousands, of, thousands of others that believe, like you and like us, that an arms embargo against Israel is the wrong thing. Yeah, exactly. And there are thousands of Christians who have already joined in the campaign. I think by now every single MP has heard from at least one Kufi supporter. And we just need to hammer it home. We need to keep messaging them, get the message to them that there are Christians here who stand with Israel and we will not be silent. And I think, you know, you said it doesn't cost anything. It costs us a couple of minutes in time. You know, there is no, you know, the MP... You know, you may never know. You could have a pro-Israel MP without even knowing it. But because, you know, we're maybe too fearful sometimes to even raise the issue of Israel, you know, we don't know necessarily what the outcome will be. And I think that happens even within um, within churches and things. Since October 7th, we have both probably had people in our churches come up to us who we never knew were pro-Israel. And they've said, you know, they've either asked us some advice or some opinion on it or something, or just encouraged us by saying, you know, I'm just letting you know, I'm watching your podcast, I'm praying for you, mm. that kind of thing. Because, you know, we, you sometimes can feel a bit isolated being mm. a pro-Israel supporter. We shouldn't be, by the way. Every single Christian should be pro-Israel. Every single Christian should understand God's plans and purposes for the Jewish people. Um, but you never know what these actions can take. And actually, like you said, God gives us the strength, you know, we were nervous the first time we started making podcasts. You know, we were nervous putting our faces out there as Kufi. But it, you know, God has given us the strength. We are now very comfortable doing what we're doing because God is with us and he's on our side. And we, you know, we are in this spiritual battle for such a time as this. And if mm. we can't raise our voices now, we can never raise our voices. So that is why we have to do it, because it is that important. Mm. Shall we read some comments, Alex, yep. from last week? Before we do that. Um, shall we mention also that it is, of course, the first anniversary of the 7th of October terrorist attacks coming up. Yep. And we're inviting Kufi supporters to remember the 7th of October attacks with us. Uh, we have produced some resources. Uh, we will be speaking more about those resources perhaps in future podcasts. But we just wanted at this point to say that we would encourage you to consider how you can commemorate the 7th of October by either setting some time aside in your church service on the 6th of October or in your prayer group or any other gathering that you are part of to think about how you can set time aside. Set time aside as a family um, or spend some time alone um, remembering what took place. And when we talk about remembering, uh, the resources we have are, for example, we have a reading uh, which we have mm. put together, uh, which can be read in church as part of a prayer and reflection. Uh, we have some videos. Um, we have some uh, candles that can be uh, can be ordered from Christians United for Israel UK from our website um, in response to a donation, which we just asked to 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 cover the production and postage of that. Um, but there are a number of resources and you can uh, use one or all or however many of those items of resources um, which are available, be made available for you. And also, once you have given some consideration to what you can do, uh, we would invite you also to let us know uh, because we would like to be able to develop a picture to demonstrate the strength of feeling of solidarity for the Jewish people, for the Jewish community in this country, and of course um, for Israel, mm. to show that Christians stand with Israel and the Jewish people. So yeah. the website is www.cufi.org.uk forward slash October 7. We will be covering some of that material ourselves in a future podcast, but yep. for now, please visit that link, think about how you can commemorate and we hope that you will find those resources to be a blessing. Yeah. 
comments. Comments. We were very grateful last week for the comments in the previous podcast. And uh, we're always very encouraged. So we're going to read a few. Yep. I've got a few here. Uh, remember, you can listen and watch this podcast on a number of platforms. Um, I'm going to read the comments from YouTube. And please do like and share and um, and subscribe to whatever uh, platform you're watching. And please do let us know your thoughts about what you've heard in this podcast about the attacks in against Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, maybe about the uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's comments regarding Starmer and the UK's decision, or whatever else we might have said. Uh, please let us know your thoughts. Um, so, last week we, of course, discussed uh, two main topics. The one was the uh, Muslim woman that stormed a London church and um, declared that she was there to kill the, quote, God of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And we also talked about the BBC anti-Israel bias that had been exposed in a report which showed that the uh, British broadcaster had breached 1,500 of its own uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. or, or sorry, its own guidelines 1,500 times, let's say. <laughs> um, but uh, so thank you for your comments. Uh, David says, thank you, Kufi, you are a needed voice. We appreciate that. Even though many in government and in the media may turn its back on Israel, we as Christians love and pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters and long for the salvation so long for their salvation and deliverance. God will show himself faithful to his people in these last days. God bless you. Also have a few encouraging uh, statements. Please support Israel. This is the home of our Lord Jesus, King David, Moses, Abraham. Um, Monica uh, points out it's actually God's land. Yep. With the reference, Joel chapter 3, verse 2. Yeah. So I thought, well, let's read Joel chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, which is the verse that uh, she shares. And it says, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Yeah, exactly. My land. Yep. I know. It's an interesting thought as well. Because I was thinking about this. Obviously, we're there for Zion's sake podcast. Who said. For Zion's sake, God. Yeah. God said, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. Yes. It wasn't telling us to not keep silent. He was actually saying he himself will not keep silent. Yes. Think about that. It's his land. He's the one speaking out, and that's why we need to speak out, because God himself said. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Just an interesting thought. No, no, no. That's, very, no, that's a good point. Uh, a comment here uh, says, I am Catholic Christian and non-Jew, but I stand for Israel. Um, that's good to hear. We have a comment from Michael who says the incident at Angel Church, it's the one in Islington, London, yep. is instructive that the woman involved is a capital blasphemer. To kill the God of the Jews is impossible, but to blot out the tetragrammaton is of the essence of Islam and of the crime of Amalek. Yep. You want to just explain what tetragrammaton is? Yeah, um, yeah basically it's the name of God. Uh, it's the ones written down in the Hebrew Bible without the letters, so Yahweh and Jehovah, mm. but without any vowels. So, okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I think I said without that, the Hebrew letters. I meant, yes, yes. I meant without vowels. Yes. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a very, very good point. Yeah, I was trying to blot uh, out the name of God. Yeah. yeah. Ble 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 bless me. And uh, just one final comment. Um, and and I think I'm really pleased that this point was raised, actually, because we didn't mention it in the podcast. It's, why is the government still hiding Malcolm Balin's report on BBC Middle East reporting? Wow. And, and yeah, th that's a very good point because this latest report highlights 1,500 um, incidents where the BBC has breached its guidelines since the 7th of October. Right. Uh, but the Balin report uh, was actually produced in 2004 right, two decades ago. Right. And this was a report into Israel uh, and Middle East coverage, effectively. And um, despite that report being produced, um, and, and uh, Malcolm Bailin has now re retired, actually, um, 
uh, he was um, at that point he was senior editorial consultant, and the report was not made public. Right. Okay. And for the past two decades, there has been continual requests for it. In fact, the BBC has spent more than three hundred and fifty thousand pounds, right, of taxpayers' money on legal fees preventing the publication of the report. Wow. Uh, it's also had numerous Freedom of Information Act requests, um, and yet they have defended this, p- tried to protect it in courtrooms, in tribunals, um, and just trying to protect it from being released. That was 2004. Mm. So what are they trying to hide? Yeah. You know? It's, yeah. Clearly, it's something they don't want yeah. to be made public. Absolutely. Which is... Which is kind of scary to think about really isn't it yeah it is and i mean that's you know two decades later um we've you know we've been we're not gonna say how many years but we've been you know obviously viewers of the news over the period of those 20 years uh and i would say that you know the bias against israel has increased yeah and is increasing um so i don't know too much about what it was like pre-2004 um yeah because i was only one (laughs) um um but uh but yeah certainly that that needs to be released because had that been released and if it was detrimental to the bbc which you know courtrooms and tribunals seem to suggest it would have been then actually some of this bias over the last two decades could have been thwarted. I mean, it, it could have actually helped the BBC to be um, less biased against Israel. Yeah. So its failure to report it is, is bad. Yeah, and I think it's eye-opening. We spoke about this last week where it's actually the, the BBC is a self-regulating body yeah. almost, even though it does report to Ofcom and there's government ministers and so forth. The BBC is working out for itself its way of reporting the news it recruits people who are like-minded yeah you know they they've re- they've recruited a lot of people from al jazeera al jazeera is well known to be not just anti-israel but you know anti-semitic as yeah. well you know there are there is that sort of thing where it's like unfortunately unless someone holds the bbc to account i don't yeah. think they're going to hold themselves to account yes um, and they're trying as hard as they can obviously to stop the truth getting out there and to to not change basically yes yeah so it's high time it's high time that uh, there is further investigation and a proper, um, you know, th- this was an independent investigation research, but yeah. there needs to be um, greater accountability um, from the BBC. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it is high time. And as Fiona says, uh, to wrap up, uh, thanks for this. Time's up for anti Semitism. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yep. Amen. Um, so, I think we've come to the end now yep. of our podcast. Um, just to close, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening and for watching this podcast. Um, please may I just remind you to like and subscribe and uh, share this podcast. And of course, to support Christians United for Israel with a donation, um, please go to cufi.org.uk forward slash donate. For now, though, we have to go. Uh, Alex needs to catch up with some of his pager messaging. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Bye-bye.